seats. We're going to start here in about two minutes. All right, we will go ahead and call this meeting of natural resources uh, to order. At this time, I'd like to ask the clerk to call the roll. Senator Carpenter, Senator Castlin, Senator Embry, Senator Harper Angel, Senator Schickel, Senator Southworth, Senator Turner, Senator Webb. Senator Westerfield, Senator Wheeler, Here. Representative Blanton, Representative Bowling, Representative Bridges, Here. Representative Birch, Here. Representative Cantrell, Representative Dossett, Present. Representative Dossett, Dotson, Here. Representative Duplessis, Here. Representative Flannery, Here. Representative Fugate, Here. Representative Johnson, Here. Representative Kirk McCormick, Here. Representative Marzian, Representative Miles, Representative Gibbons Prunty, here. Representative Scott, Representative Stevenson, Representative Wesley, here. Representative White, here. Co Chair Smith, Present. And Co Chair Gooch, here. All right, we have a quorum at this time. I'd like to ask for a motion to approve the minutes. Uh, second. second. All those in favor of the sign of aye. Opposed, likewise, the motion carries. Folks, at this time, if you join me, I'm going to have Chris Fugit lead us in prayer. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for the opportunity to be here today. And Lord, thank you for the blessings that you give us, even in tough times. Lord, we pray for those back home that are hurting today, that have lost a lot of things and lost some lives. Lord, I pray you'd bless every family. I pray, God, you'd help us to be a help to those that we can. I thank you for all the help that's come in to East Kentucky from all over our state, but also other states, Lord, that have come just to lend a hand to uh, talk to those who have lost so much. And I pray, Lord, that you'd give us wisdom in the coming days that we'd do things and do policy that would be a help to those that, that need it the most. And, Lord, just thank you for just thank you for loving us. And I pray, Lord, that we'd live our lives to please you and to help others around us every day. And we thank you for it. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 And while you're standing, follow me at the Pledge of Allegiance, please. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, as we get started this morning, um, obviously, as, as what Representative Fugit had mentioned about the devastation that's happened in, in the mounds of eastern Kentucky, uh, I will tell you that it's really uh, too hard for me to talk about, honestly. But I do want to mention that uh, we had a meeting a few days ago, and we had the Senate president came down. We had Senator Thayer and, and Julie Rock, Senator Adams, um, and, uh, and Chris Mc, Senator McDaniels came down and some staff and we we sat down without any media uh, which i have to tell you i really like that because uh, it wasn't a publicity stunt and we brought in our a lot of our mayors and our judges and sat down in a room and started going through some of the numbers of, of what it's going to take to start trying to uh, you know rebuild and recover eastern kentucky and i i just appreciated that a lot i've seen a lot of um 
people come in and drop off supplies and take a photo of themselves and put it on Facebook and leave. And I've seen a lot of people fly and spend a lot of money and not drop off a single bottle of water. Uh, so I appreciate my leadership uh, in the Senate uh, and, and Chris, Representative Fugit, um, and Representative Wesley. There's so many in here and, and Senator Turner that have been on the ground uh, helping us. Um, but I appreciate the ones that are doing it behind the scenes and you don't see them doing interviews and you don't see the cameras, but what you do see is somebody up to their knees in mud handing somebody diapers or water or MREs or, or a tent uh, or air mattress or wading across a creek to take somebody a generator so they can have an air conditioner. So there's a lot of heroes uh, that you may not see in a photo op or may never even hear about. Uh, so my comments today are to those people and they know who they are. Our National Guard, these airmen and women have done stuff that is absolutely incredible. Uh, to be the first ones on the scene, to pull people out of the roofs of their house, uh, to grab children uh, that were pulled out of their parents' arms in the streams. The, the rescue dog, I don't know if you've seen this. Uh, what's her, Allie, is that her name? I always get this wrong. Um, but this incredible dog, if you noticed in, in any of the stuff that we were able to post, how muddy that dog was. If you knew how many times that animal had had to go into the most awful you know, churning water to, to, to make a rescue, really, really incredible stuff. So with that said, uh, I'd like to ask just for a moment of silence for the heroes uh, of the flood of 2022. All right, now let's get on with our meeting. We're going to go just a little bit out of order. Uh, wait, I'm getting directed for something else here. Oh yeah, we, we have a new staff person, which I met just a little while ago, and I, I'm gonna apologize in advance, Kayla, if I get your last name wrong, but is it, it's Caraway. If you'll please stand up so everybody can see you and welcome to our, our team. It's very nice to have you with us. Let's give her. <clears throat> All right, now I'm gonna ask Fish and Wildlife to come up to the table. Uh, do we see the commissioner in here, or anybody with Fish and Wildlife? Uh, and we're going to let them go first because it won't take just a minute. It's just some housekeeping stuff that we have. Uh, as you sit down, please introduce yourself for our records. Hi, I'm Jenny Gilbert. Oh, uh, Ms. Gilbert, Sorry. could you yes. yeah, turn your mic on for us? Yes, I'm Jenny Gilbert. I'm in the commissioner's office, and Commissioner Storm does want me to convey his thanks to you all and to this committee for your support. He's sorry he's not able to be here today. Well, I will say this about Commissioner Storm. We had a young 18-year-old boy who lost his life helping in this stuff. And I know that he personally went uh, and visited with that family. And just as I was coming in here, uh, uh, the uncle of the young man was talking about just how much of an impression that that left on that family for him to drive mm -hmm. over there uh, to just check on them. So mm -hmm. please convey to the commissioner, we appreciate his quiet efforts uh, in Eastern Kentucky. Yes. You have a, we need to do a quick amendment for you. Uh, yes, sir. So if you want to go ahead and, and explain that, and we can go ahead and get a motion to get you guys out of here. Okay. This is simple. It was just one of the regs that we sent to you all uh, through the admin reg um, review subcommittee. It was going to expire as part of the sunset law, um, and they had filed that months ago. And then through the legislative um, session, there were some changes that were um, needed in order to conform to SB 217. And so that's why the amendment was necessary at this point. We wanted to do it now before the regulation became effective, and then we had to open it up again and go through that long process. So this is a, um, an emergency amendment. Let's see if there's any questions um, before we make a motion to approve this for them. Seeing none, is there a motion to approval for the agency's amendment? I have a motion. Do we have a second? A motion and a second. All those in favor, sign of aye. Aye. All those opposed, likewise. The motion's approved favorably for you, and so it passes. Yes. Yes, I'm going to yield to Representative Fugit. I just want you to convey to Rich and Eric Gibson and all the officers who have been down there working this week. They've been to our church and loaded their trucks up with food and water and supplies. And after the rescue and efforts were finished and they were all part I think every officer down there was part of the rescue teams also. But ever since that, every officer has come 
loaded up and took truckloads of stuff out to people who need it. And I just I appreciate Rich's uh, Commissioner Storm's leadership, Eric Gibson's leadership. And everything that you all have done for the people in East Kentucky. And that I just want to say that publicly, thank you all for everything you've done. Well, thank, thank you, Mr. You. Chairman. Yeah. You all have been in our thoughts and prayers and many discussions at the department. And we've had people from every division that have been delivering hot meals and taking cases of water. Um, and I would like to recognize them just, just in conjunction with what you're saying, because it's really been a concerted effort by the whole department to support you all. And we'll continue to do it. No, we echo that. We appreciate you all. So with your motion carry, the rest of your regulations just simply needed to be on our agenda. So yes, you sir. are free to go. But um, as you're leaving the table, I do want to mention um, Representative Fugit right now as he's here has, has got a complete full building full of people on cots uh, that he's been responsible for daily since we brought them in. The, the, I think they said 1,500 people came through our gateway there at the airport. And I apologize. Um, for my voice, I've, I've been dealing with a little bit of heat stroke, but Representative Fugit has been one of those unsung heroes. And I know Representative Wesley has been on the ground as well, and I'm sure others here have been. I, I apologize, I Senator Turner too. But I just, he will leave here today and probably feed or tend to or take care of over 100 some people. And then he'll spend the rest of the day out in these communities taking stuff. And so I'd, I'd like to, honestly, I'd like to honor uh, these men if we could let's just please give them a round of applause I, I know they don't want it <clears throat> and I know they don't want it I know Chris is going to kill me but I will tell you uh, from my heart I appreciate uh, the sacrifice and the fact that it doesn't end here with us just thanking them I, I know what the rest of his day is going to look like and the rest of his week and the long term uh, fight for us to be out there doing it and, and, and Chris I appreciate that all right guys on to work Senator Turner uh, <clears throat> Mr. Chairman, I thank you, but we've got to stop right in the middle of that because the chairman has been as busy and done as much as the rest of us have. So he needs a special round of applause for him. Thank, thank you. Uh, let's go ahead and get, uh, looks like David uh, McGowan, and um, I'm sorry, Rusty Cress, go ahead and come up, and Dean Foreman, I think, is with you all. Anybody you all want to actually come to the table, and, and you all please go ahead and identify yourselves for the records, and then I'll turn it over to you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. I'm Rusty Cress with Dinsmore & Show here on behalf of the American Petroleum Institute, and it is my pleasure to introduce David McGowan, who is the Southeast Regional Director for State Government Affairs for American Petroleum Institute. Uh, he'll give a brief introduction, and then he will turn it over to our expert who is on Zoom there, Dean. Thank you very much, Rusty. Um, Mr. Chairman, uh, members of the committee, thank you so much for the opportunity to be here with you today. Uh, as Rusty said, my name is David McGowan. I'm the Southeast Region Director for the American Petroleum Institute. Um, API is the largest and oldest national trade association that represents all aspects of the oil and natural gas business. Uh, we have approximately 600 member companies from large uh, supplier members down to small um, uh, service and, and supply companies. Um, as, as Rusty mentioned, again, I'm, I'm in the southeast region, represent the southeast region here. Uh, that consists of Virginia, the Carolinas, Georgia, Tennessee, and Kentucky. Um, and I first want to take an opportunity to extend our sympathies and my sympathies to the folks of Eastern Kentucky and, and to you, Representative Fugate, and you, Senator Smith, for all the work that y'all have done and, and uh, the challenges that you are facing. And certainly understand and appreciate that. And again, extend our sympathies to you and, and all of your constituents. Um, as Rusty mentioned, we're fortunate today uh, to have a true expert on the line with us. Um, I'm certainly not an expert um, in, in all of the issues of, of the industry. Um, and uh, so we have uh, Dean Foreman, uh, Dr. Dean Foreman on the line with us today. Um, Dean is the chief economist for the American Petroleum Institute. 
Um, he comes, he came to API after a long career with a number of companies throughout the industry, including uh, ExxonMobil, Repsol, and Saudi Aramco. Um, Dean is a foremost expert on energy uh, markets, um, both globally and here in the United States, and specifically, obviously, related to oil and natural gas. And so I'm very thankful to have Dean here today. Um, again, he, he, uh, he's going to give the, the bulk of the presentation and um, um, kind of give you his perspective on what's going on, again, in the global markets as well as in the markets here in the United States, and then more specifically, what's been happening here in Kentucky. So um, again, thank you for the opportunity to, to be here today. Um, look forward to trying to answer any questions that you may have at the appropriate time. So uh, Mr. Chairman, I'll, I'll turn it back to you um, or, or to Dean, what's ever appropriate. If we can, we'll go ahead and yield to Dean at this time. Thank you very much. It's an honor to be able to address you all. Um, I'd echo the sympathies also for the for the flooding in Eastern Kentucky and people affected by it. Uh, my grandparents on my dad's side were from Winchester, so I, I appreciate the ability to speak to you today. I'm gonna share my screen here. If you don't mind confirming that you're seeing it, I'd appreciate it. Yes, we can see it, thank you. Okay, so in addition to being the largest trade association representing all aspects of the industry as David mentioned. We're also a data source on the industry. We survey up to 90% of the companies across the US every week. So we are a leading source where we put out reports on a weekly basis with weekly estimates a day ahead of the US Energy Information Administration and monthly estimates with the latest report coming out today actually, two months ahead of EIA. So we have some of the best quality information uh, it's contemporary. I'd like whatever is on your mind concerning gasoline, diesel, oil prices, energy, whatever you'd like to discuss today, we'll leave time to, to go through that. I've put together some materials here that summarize a lot of this current information. The, here are the key takeaways. And when we look at gasoline prices year on year, just comparing what's happened this year, yeah, they were elevated up until a few weeks ago and they've come down and they've come down with crude oil. They went up with crude oil, they've come down with crude oil. And it's important when you look over the first half of the year and just compare back to last year, over 85% of the change that consumers are seeing in the price of the pump has related directly to, it's the pulse of just crude oil prices globally having gone up. And keep in mind, these are global markets. It's a globally traded commodity. A lot of buyers, a lot of sellers, but the rest of it that you'd be talking about that's not crude oil is only 15% of the difference here. So keep that in mind. And you're, you've been fortunate in Kentucky that maybe 13 cents per gallon is due to having lower taxes than the average nationwide, but at least last year and through the first half of this year, Kentucky has averaged 29 cents per gallon less than nationwide average. So while it's gone up, and it's been painful for many consumers, Kentucky has fared relatively better than the nationwide average. Now, there are a lot of things that affect oil prices, and we'll go through some of the fundamentals on this of what's happened. We'll talk about Russia, Ukraine. There's one thing that really starkly stands out more than any other though, and it, it bears in the report we just put out today. We are still a million barrels per day as a nation below our high water mark of the, the most crude oil we produced was a little over 13 million barrels per day in late 2019 and early 2020. And right now we're sitting around 12 million barrels per day. That difference of 1 million barrels per day is what we are currently taking out of our strategic petroleum reserves. So if we're, we're papering over it or performing triage to, to try to compensate for demand that's been outstripping production. Demand as it exists today is very close to where it was in 2019. In fact, if we're looking at the weekly data that came out yesterday, 21.2 uh, million barrels per day of consumption of petroleum products in the United States. That's up almost 9% since the same point last year. So it, despite a diminished economic expectation, a slower economy that's expected here, you know, as if the economy is growing at all, it needs more energy. And we're seeing the energy demand, oil, natural gas, 
across the, the spectrum of all energy going hand in hand with the economy here. Now, as demand in the US and globally has been holding up really well, you know, production due to a combination of workforce and supply chain and financial and energy policy headwinds has really been challenged to step up and meet, meet that demand challenge. And in the way the US Energy Information Administration or EIA does its outlook going forward, and you can't just take it as a projection, you have to look at it as they make certain assumptions. If those assumptions hold, then you, you can model the outcome that they show. And the key assumptions that they make are that OPEC would respond this year by expanding its production 2.2 million barrels per day is the latest assumption. It had been as high as 2.8 million barrels per day. And that the US would add 1.4 million barrels per day. That is what's necessary in their view to balance global markets. So far up to this point in the year, neither of these assumptions have tracked particularly well compared to the reality of, for example, how much OPEC has agreed to put on in the wake of President Biden's visit to Riyadh last month. So as of you know, recently, OPEC's running at about half of this amount and the US is trailing the amount that's shown here. So where this shortage of the million barrels per day that I mentioned that we're trying to make out of strategic petroleum reserves is showing up. We now have, in terms of inventories in the United States, commercial, commercially held inventories are at their lowest level as of August 5th since 2014. Lowest level since 2014. And this is financial market lingo, but futures markets, which you know enable you to, just like in commodities, futures for agricultural goods, you can buy or sell commodities contractually for the future with an obligation to deliver them physically. So the, the skins in the game of um, you know, for oil markets in buying or selling with firm commitments, the ability to, to you know, either hedge the price or have physical delivery of these things in, in months that come. The futures prices have been, the term is backward dated, but the, the prices in months in the future are lower than the prices today in the futures market. When that happens, you have very little incentive to buy and hold inventories. That's why these commercial inventories are at their lowest since 2014. And that's expected behavior. It's economic and normal behavior for the way inventories would work for any business that's trying to be efficient in the way it runs. When you don't have that though, and when you expect and see that commercial inventories are getting historically low, the fallback for this and our nationwide strategic petroleum reserves are meant to guard America against a potential disruption in supply. We now have, as of the end of March, the Biden administration announced an unprecedentedly large release of a million barrels per day over six months. So 180 million barrel drawdown in our strategic petroleum reserves. We now have, and we're about four to five months into that, the lowest SPR, Strategic Petroleum Reserve, since 1985. 1985, think of all the oil market events that have occurred since then. And I can't tell you what'll happen next, whether it'll be more of Russia, Ukraine, whether it could be something else geopolitical from China, Taiwan, something with Iran, Straits of Hormuz, nuclear scaremongering by North Korea, we don't know. It could be something as simple as a hurricane that affects the US Gulf Coast like we had last year that removes one or more million barrels per day of capacity, of production capacity, and the ability to export for a period of time. Any of these things has the ability to, to affect American consumers deeply in an environment where our strategic reserves are historically low, and that's where we are today. So again, the concepts are the fuel prices really ride historically, and we're gonna see this, I'll hit the highlights in a second, but fuel prices are going hand in hand with crude oil. Crude oil depends on many factors, but when you have low inventories, geopolitics, logistical factors, these things tend to have you know, the ability to punch above their weight, so to speak. Right now, one of the things that we're watching closely are diesel or distillate inventories, especially on the East Coast. The East Coast is the most affected by Russia, Ukraine, in the sense that normally you trade products back and forth between Europe and the East Coast of the United States. Uh, that hasn't worked so well you know, since Russia's war in Ukraine escalated. On top of that, there were some products, um, heavier kinds of oils that weren't 
crude oil, but they weren't finished products either. But intermediate things that Russians would send and would be imported to some refineries on the East Coast that would enable them to make a lot more diesel fuel. And we'll talk about the, the refining process in one of the slides that comes. But with the sanctions that are in place and the inability to do that, refiners within the region have been able to produce relatively less diesel fuel than they otherwise might. And if you can't trade for it and you can't produce it, it results in to meet demand, drawing your inventories down. So the inventories are historically low, especially for distance on the East Coast and we're monitoring. The, the overall takeaway from this is we have the ability as a nation to control our fate here. We have the resources, we have the know-how, we have the capital, we need the ability to unlock these resources, to have infrastructure to deliver it, refining processes that are cost economic. And frankly, API has our, we call it our 10 for 2022 plan, 10 things that Washington, the Biden administration and states could do right now to help energize these resources, the infrastructure and bringing things to market in a way that would help consumers all the way at the pump. So. Having hit the highlights, let's look first at a comparison of US and Kentucky gasoline prices compared with crude oil prices as paid by refiners to acquire crude oil. The left-hand side of this is a graphic from the US Energy Information Administration. It just breaks out the price at the pump based on the percentage of four main factors, crude oil at 55%, refining 27%, distribution and marketing 8%, taxes 10%. And this is based on June data, which is the latest that are on their website today. At that time, the retail price was just under $5 a gallon and Kentucky was 23 cents a gallon below that. Notice the 55%, the majority of this being crude oil. If you look at, again, the year to year change though, it accounts for over 85% of the change since last year through the first half of this year. So that's important because again, on a change basis, that's really how we explain to consumers what's been happening since last year. If you understand what's happened with crude oil, you understand what's happened with gasoline prices here. And you see graphically the, the real prices over time shown on the right-hand side, the Kentucky prices in blue plotted along with the nationwide average in white for gasoline. The pattern matches that hey, exactly. Dean, let me stop you just for a second. Absolutely. Um, and just to tell the, the, the members, we are going to get you a printout of the stuff that we've got. We thought we had it in our packet, and Rusty's going to make sure that, that you have a copy of all the stuff that's being presented for you to be able to sit down and take a look at it. So I apologize it's not in your folder, but you will be presented with all this information. Please go ahead, Dean. Thank you, Senator Smith. I appreciate it. Uh, the difference between Kentucky and nationwide prices is the blue at the below the bar, below the access area that you see over time. And you see consistently it's been below the nationwide average. So this says Kentucky's supply, and you, you've got a mix of different supply sources. You have some in-state refining, but Kentucky relies a lot on interstate trade. So be it spurs of the colonial pipeline that go up into Tennessee, and then some of that product is taken by truck or rail north, you bring in through waterways some, and you've got refining in Ohio and other areas that you know, where product comes down as well. So that variety and that diversity of supply is, is important as to why you get cost-effective supplies in the state. That plus historically low uh, state taxes compared to many other states has been helpful for consumers. Now let's compare this with diesel and the picture for diesel fuel is a little bit different. It's the same in the, the same message that crude oil and diesel prices uh, have historically gone hand in hand here on a monthly basis. That sticks. It's a little bit lower in terms of the percent that goes into crude oil or from crude oil into the price of the pump. So a little less than half. A little bit, it, there's a typographical error on this. This should say 29% for refining, not 49%. And I'll correct that in, in the final version that we send you. But that 29% refining, it requires relatively more processing compared with gasoline. And if you're looking at the far right-hand side in terms of the price patterns, the it, notice you see where prices have gone up and we saw this in recent months above 2022, you see how high it's gone compared to where 
it, it's gone up proportionally more than what you see in the crude oil. And the reason for that is that globally, as a result of Russia, Ukraine, there has been an abject shortage internationally of distillates. And distillates includes diesel fuel, ultra low sulfur diesel fuel, which goes on road, as well as heating oil, which is slightly uh, potentially higher. So you're talking zero to 15 parts per million of sulfur in ultra low sulfur diesel, 15 to 500 parts per million for heating oil. And the ability to produce more of this, the heavier the kind of crude oil, the quality of crude oil that goes in the front end of a refinery, the relatively more of heavier products, distillates that you can produce in the cut of the way refineries work and the yield that you naturally get out of it. And we'll talk about the refining processes in a second, but it's important to know that you know, it's really hard to compensate if you get a big shift on the international side within the relatively narrow bands in which domestic supply and demand for these products, both gasoline and diesel, but it's really the diesel market internationally where we've seen the supply dry up and a big pull for US exports as a result of it. Kentucky's prices, by the way, also 16 cents per gallon below the nationwide average here. The many factors that affect crude oil, again, the vast majority of the change for gasoline prices, you know it, right? Supply and demand, the economy comes back. Our primary data for the industry have been showing for a year and a half, literally, and our reports have been showing that demand was coming back after the pandemic along with the economy. It surged. It, it really has been at or above 2019 levels, depending upon the week or the month that we look at. Seasonality matters, inventory, as we've already discussed matters, and we now have historically low inventories, capacity utilization matters. So refiners have been for consecutive months running almost flat out. You know, the latest week, it's over 93% capacity utilization, but this is historically very strong. The strongest certainly since 2019 that we've seen in terms of running. The value after refining, this is really like the, the change between taking crude oil and upgrading it into a combination of different products, you know, what's the margin hey, that's associated Dan, let me, with? Let me stop you just for a second. I apologize. Uh, we've Absolutely. got a, we've got a question uh, from Senator Wheeler, if you don't mind. Uh, and Not I also want to mention before he speaks, when I was talking earlier about some of these hidden heroes that were in the back working very hard. Senator Wheeler is one of those. Uh, he, he was with us at our meeting. He's been on the awesome. ground. He's been taking a tremendous leadership role over in Pikeville and the vacuum over there of getting things done on the ground and certainly want to give attention to the fact that he's worked very, very hard and has not been out in front of the camera to do so. So I really appreciate that, Senator Wheeler, and I'll yield to you for a question. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you for your kind comments. You stated earlier you were when you were talking about some of the solutions that uh, the federal government, I guess, is in the, the Biden administration as well as state governments can can do. Um, I guess based upon what you've seen and the messaging coming out of Washington, how many of these steps do you actually expect the Biden administration to take to lower petroleum prices to the consumer? It's hard for me to predict on the legislative side. I, I think we're, we're doing our best to have a dialogue with them. They're incentivized, especially in advance of elections, to try to work with industry to make sure that supply solutions are coming. One of the follow-ons, unfortunately, this Inflation Reduction Act, um, it, it doesn't go as far as it needs to in terms of things that will actually help consumers at the pump. So infrastructure, it, permitting reform for infrastructure, pipelines in particular is critical both for oil and for natural gas and consumer affordability. This is one area where there's been a pledge to try to come together and, and see if, if that can move forward. I can't read the tea leaves on exactly politically what will happen there, but the hope is that people realize that that was something that got left out of this and there were some follow-on commitments that were supposed to happen to do that. Access to resources by law and there was a pause last year by the Biden administration on new leases on federal lands. That, that pause, they, they must by law resume leasing, but it's become more expensive to do some of the leasing. And we don't yet have a renewal of a five-year plan on leasing. So that I think will get sorted, but it's, it has yet to be worked out. Um, there's some ref refinery processes that um, should be protected and, you know, alkylation process, we'll, we'll continue to see that move forward. I think that's likely. Um, 
some of the things on repealing steel tariffs. You know, there's a pledge to try to uh, ha have some more normalized trade. We're advocating that steel tariffs that have been, and it's not just tariffs, by the way, it's quotas, countries like South Korea that may have opted into a quota system instead of just taking a 30% import on steel or steel tariff import uh, cost. If they hadn't imported certain kinds of steel equipment or oil, oil country tubular goods in the last three years, their quota might have been zero, which basically means that, and we've had producers across Texas and other places stand up and say they just can't get what they need to be able to be operational in the field without you know, and continue to drill and expand unless they have these components. So that's one where, again, it seems likely to to get some traction because it's just a no-brainer that you should be able to normalize those trade relationships. Trade cooperation across North America, normalizing more with Canada, also with Mexico, again, in our interest to continue those discussions. So hard to read the tea leaves on exactly where the administration will come out, but so many of these things are common sense. It really would make sense to elevate them. Does that help? Uh yeah. If I may do a brief follow-up, Mr. Yes, Chairman. Yes, please do go ahead. Yeah, uh, I guess to what extent has the cancellation of the Keystone XL pipeline and uh, and the uh, different uh, viewpoint of the administration towards fossils, uh, how has that affected production in the United States uh, since uh, January of 2021? It's a fantastic question, and policy has had a critical impact. Literally the day after the Biden administration was inaugurated, they revoked the environmental permit on the Keystone XL pipeline. They've also threatened the environmental permit on the Dakota Access Pipeline, which is an absolute lifeline for oil production out of North Dakota. These factors, plus the fact that you know, reportedly as recently as the fourth quarter last year, Secretary Granholm was shopping the idea of banning energy exports from the US. It is really hard if you can't build infra interstate infrastructure, uh, refiners along the Gulf Coast that have needed more of this heavier oil from Canada, they can't get it from Venezuela, and they can't get enough from Canada. So this means the processes that they have in place for refining to take medium and heavier grades of crude oil that are necessary for a lot of product markets, they haven't had enough of it since 2018 to be able to run those units optimally. If we had Keystone XL, that, that would have helped alleviate this problem greatly and really enabled some optimization, just like we saw with the lifting of the ban on crude oil exports back in um, late end of 2015, early 2016, the exports ramped up. This enabled refiners to operate, to match their units with the quality of crude oil they needed. They became a lot more efficient. And now when you contemplate rebanning those exports, um, th th that's been, it would do nothing but raise costs for Americans and result in less, less efficient refining. So these policies, it's Keystone XL, but it's a lot of other things. It's it's the pause again uh, on the leasing. If a lot of producers don't have three or five years worth of line of sight forward in terms of where they're gonna drill, they can't contract or, or build the gathering systems that are necessary. So the pipelines, they can't contract for oil services. And by the way, services and people are really important especially post COVID. You know, five years ago, the industry, the mantra was the crew change that upwards of half of the industry was eligible to retire within 10 years. And as a result of COVID, we saw a lot more acceleration than that. We've got service companies, you know, scrambling, going to retail malls, people who never worked in the, the oil patch to come be recruited to work in. And that means if you've got inexperienced people being brought in and being trained, you have to slow down, maintain operations integrity, be safe, having the ability to deal with these workforce and supply chain issues at the same time with policy signaling that they don't want natural gas or oil in the future to nearly the same extent. They've been willing to go I to- I cut you off there and I apologize. We've got uh, three, four other guests. Uh, we want to give them some time short. too. Uh, so just put you guys on hold. And again, I apologize. <clears throat> but if Brian, uh, Clark and Scott, uh, Kaiser, I apologize if I get this wrong. Tom, uh, Coloza, and Leah Taylor, if you guys want to come on up too. You don't have to leave if there's room at the table. But, but while you're coming up the table, one of the, uh, the questions that, that I had is I followed the testimony that Flying Jay had, had presented in front of Congress. 
And that was one of the things that sitting there having been in the gas business and, and knowing what allocation is, it was concerning to me to have them uh, to say, uh, you know, that they were getting uh, pressure to short diesel exhaust fluid, that they were getting pressured to uh, short the, the off-road and on-road diesel. Uh, they had a major company uh, telling Congress um, that, that, that they were intentionally, it looked like to me, uh, being shorted and pushed to to short the market, which is creating higher gas prices. But you know, from from the years of, of where I used to be, uh, you know, with the KPMA and, and the industry, we went through allocation uh, during the Obama administration, where your gas station could only get the same amount of gallons you got the month before, and this went on on and on and on. Sure. And what happened was you'd see a lot of these bags on the pumps, and it wasn't that the pump was torn up. There was no fuel in the pumps. And so I wanted you to address, uh, as, as we have the petroleum uh, guys come to the table, some of the issues that we're seeing from when government starts to decide on how to regulate your operations and allocation takes place, what you're seeing as far as your ability of getting product out there um, and having bags on your pump where you have people that need it. Uh, and there's a shortage of fuel, not the will to sell. The people that have the buildings, bills are still the same, uh, but you're not able to get a hold of the product, and that's causing a problem for a lot of the people, not only in this room, but families back in our district, because that's also one of the big reasons that's causing these prices to creep up, and that's something that government is creating. So I'll, I'll turn it over to you all to, to, to wrap it up for us. Shall I? weigh in with maybe the last slide and just show the comparison for diesel or distillates, the production, the demand, uh, the exports, and the inventories. Yeah, if you want to, you know, we don't have that much time left, and I want to make sure to let uh, Brian and Scott and them say something. So, uh, and oh, we have a question from uh, Representative Plessy. Well, um, in the uh, angst of time, I, I don't want to take too much time, but I did have two things that I wanted to be sure to get uh, Mr. Foreman to speak to. Um, for one, in Kentucky, uh, we have a fairly large uh, soy-based biodiesel refiner, and my understanding is that uh, soy uh, biodiesel is added at about 1% to the standard diesel formula. Is uh, Maybe that's not the right number, but could could the API work to be, be allow, to allow higher levels of soy diesel um, so that we can offset the lack of heavy crude? And then my second question is, um, if you look at Kentucky, we have a, an issue with in Louisville uh, where we have um, reformulated gasoline that really pushes up the price there. And I'll give you an example that just happened this week. Um, Henderson, Kentucky was at 281. I have a picture on my phone. I'm driving from, I drive a lot. And uh, the same day, Owensboro's 330, Elizabethtown's 330, Louisville's 389. Um, we need some help with reformulated gas pricing and getting that taken off the table because my understanding is that the advantage of reformulated gas environmentally is not what it once was. So if you could speak to those two things, that would be great. So reformulated gasoline, taking that first, I mean, nationwide, it's a market that's about half the size of conventional gasoline. You're talking three versus six million barrels per day, roughly, roughly. And if you have unique boutique or you know, state-specific fuel standards that can affect the processing and the cost and how fungible or tradable your reformulated gasoline could be versus other states. The more consistent it is with other states, the easier it is to bring it in. And it, these are state regulatory issues in terms of the environmental cost versus the environmental benefit and the economic cost and benefit in making those choices. It's hard for me from an API perspective to weigh in on, you know, specifically on Louisville and, and what you've seen in terms of that very Variance, that does seem like a lot. But uh, again, keep in mind that the fuel retailers tend to, um, you know, 97% of them are independently owned and operated and set their own prices. They, when I talk to retailers, they set their prices generally with you know, a keen understanding of what their replacement cost is for the next cargo. And then the extent of local competition, the station where you took the picture, you know, if, you, if it has a big box retailer next to it that sells a lot of things it tends to be very competitive and might use gasoline or diesel as a loss leader to bring people in the door uh, as opposed to another station that might not have 
the same, but many of them will tell you that from a convenience store standpoint or a retailing standpoint, that it's in their interest to try to attract foot traffic and customers, and they don't make that much off the motor fuel sales themselves. So net net, it's hard to explain the exact variance and local conditions can vary, but they are incentivized to you know, make these competitive decisions and setting their own prices there. Hey, Remind well, me your other question. Let me ask Lee if I could, because I do know that uh, Lee is actually um, with Carmel Lake <laughs> Shell, and you can probably speak to this personally, and I want to make sure you, you get some time. But uh, Leah, do you want to maybe address some of the issues that uh, the representative asked and certainly take some time to talk about it from your very unique perspective being in this market? Sure. Sure. Can you hear me? <laughs> is it on? Okay. Can you hear me? Thank you. So I'm not in the Louisville market, so I, I can't speak to reformulated gasoline, although I do know that it is much higher. It, the, it does drive the cost up. But as Mr. Foreman was pointing out, um, he's very accurate in, in the fact that com this is a very competition-driven industry. So um, whenever you've got a big box that's right next to you, and I'm a small retailer, it's hard to compete with that. But if you don't compete with it, then those people will not show up on your parking lot. And if they're not on your parking lot, then they're not coming in your store to buy other merchandise. Ms. Taylor, could I also add that, did you, that as a smaller operator, you might have the volume. And so what you're dealing with is a pooled margin. So one of your tankers could have a variance of 20, I mean, there's really no limit to it. You have a dollar difference in what you have in the ground. So you buy one load and you have got you get it for $3. The next load comes in, could be $4.50, and you still have some of that in the ground. So you're constantly adding and subtracting to these costs. So if you're moving at a slower speed and your store does $100,000, $200,000, and one of the places across the street is doing $600,000, they're going to have the chance to have some of the cheaper prices from the sheer volume. So it's unlike a few other industries in the world that still rolls on the nine tenths of a cent on a pool margin. It's a very complicated format, but it's based upon the fact that you're slowing, your sales are maybe slower or greater. It depends on how the game is. And those costs for every single truck are going to be different coming in is just kind of to do a thumbnail to it. That's exactly correct. And uh, speaking to that, you know, especially during mitigating circumstances such as weather events and geopolitical events, rack price can change from 20 to 60 cents in just a few days. And I may not be able to turn over my product quick enough, and I've got it at the high cost, and then suddenly it's coming down, but I'm not, I'm not turning my product over every day. So the smaller retailer is caught in between there. And so they have to make that decision. Am I going to be, am I going to try to stay reasonably competitive in order not to lose my customer base? Or do I just, you know, have to go up in order to cover my costs? Because we all have different, different costs. You know, some of us have more mortgage than others and labor costs have escalated. They've gone out the roof. You know, well, we, and credit card is is, is moved to the credit, credit unit. Cards. You've got to charge. So mm -hmm. if you're making three cents on a gallon, and I come in and fill up my my F three fifty, and swipe my card, then you've got to pay so much of that money. Now you're splitting it with whoever my card company happens to be. So, or worse, I come in and fill up and drive off, and so you're making Correct. three cents a gallon. I just took two hundred dollars away from you. It takes a lot of fuel to make it back to that two hundred point, but. Um, so it says it's very complicated with it, and it's, it varies upon, like I said, volume flow, other costs that are associated with who's processing your cards at the pump when you're using the credit card, um, and your overall what's called shrink or drive-offs. And those are costs that we have no control over. Uh, to your point on the credit card fees, whenever whenever gas was at five dollars a gallon, our our credit card fees could be anywhere from ten to fifteen cents, and we're just operating on pennies not dollars. So that, that completely cuts our profit completely out. So credit card fees are a huge factor for us in, in combating costs. So I appreciate those comments. 
And while we have you all at the table there, I know that uh, um, uh, was at, was going to have some comments. Tom, let's yield over to you for a second. How are you? Can you help me? Can you hear me? Is what yes. I'm asking. <laughs> okay, let me let me share my screen. I I've been around the oil business for about. Uh, Oh, 47 years. Uh, and uh, can you see the, that uh, little headline slide there real quick? Can't see it? Hold on. No, but we can see your beautiful blue tie. That's nice. <laughs> <laughs> well, hold on one sec. Let's try this again. How about now? I might be on stop sharing, but uh, thank God I'm not an engineer. Or I'd be disgraced right now. Yeah, if you'll look just quickly for our members, if you'll look in your folder, this is what he's referring to. So yeah. You do have it in front of you there. Okay. Uh, you know, you can follow along and I can speak extemporaneously to some of the points here. Um, first of all, I work for Opus. I was a founder of Opus, oil price information service, and we are fiercely independent. In other words, we have customers that range from oil producers, but mostly from refiners down to end users, consumers, fleets, and so forth. So we have a little bit different perspective than a lot of folks. Uh, many, many of the things that uh, Dr. Dean mentioned, I absolutely agree with, uh, but I am gonna differentiate a little bit between some of the things that you know might be more political than actual. Uh, and, but first of all, let me say this, that my former colleague, Dan Jurgen, who has won one more Pulitzer Prize than me, one. Uh, he mentioned that this is an energy crisis mm -hmm. and it's not just an oil crisis. It's all across all sorts of different energy. I'll give you an example. Uh, about three weeks ago, London avoided a blackout because the Belgians were fortunate enough to be able to basically give them some power and it equated to a price, and I'm not making this up, of about $17,000 per barrel. So if you ever need electricity, don't call Belgium or Brussels anytime soon. Uh, what we're seeing right now in Europe is absolutely frightening. We're seeing natural gas prices that are the equivalent of between $400 a barrel and $425 a barrel. And that's well before winter, and it's all about Vladimir Putin and uh, him weaning people off of uh, Russian gas molecules. Now, I will say this much. Russia uh, talked a good game about eliminating some of their crude oil and, and uh, diesel exports to the rest of the world, and particularly in Europe. But largely, since the invasion of Ukraine in February, they're exporting a little bit more crude than they were, let's say, last year. So it's the threat of Vladimir Putin, but not necessarily the reality of it so far. But if you think for a moment that energy just means oil, uh, look at what's happening with nuclear plants being threatened to shut down or being idled as, as their time has come to an end. Look at electricity, uh, you know, those rates in Europe, hopefully they're not coming here. And look at natural gas. I mean, if we get natural gas prices even one third or one half of the prices in Europe, we might all want to have a natural gas oven to stick our heads into. So that's one of the problems at the moment. Uh, and I absolutely agree uh, with Dean that, uh, you know, that has an impact. We are a global market right now. And it's a global market that for a portion of 2022 was epically profitable for oil producers and oil refiners, most of which. Uh, but at some point, you know, some of those epic profits are going to come back. And what I would stress is that it's not some sort of collusion or setting of the prices. The market sets the prices every day, whether it's, you know, someone bidding for Bitcoin or whether they're bidding for futures prices uh, in New York Harbor. I, I think one of the questions had to do with reformulated gasoline. And I looked at it this morning, and I will tell you that this year has seen epic prices for reformulated gasoline 
in those little niches of the Great Lakes uh, supplied markets that use it. You know, for many years, you would see a difference of about five or eight cents a gallon in uh, the summer or maybe even the fall. The difference now is 30 or 40 cents a gallon. Maybe that doesn't justify retail in Louisville selling for, you know, four dollars when the rest of the state is, is closer to three. But it's one of the things that really impacts prices in the summer. And by the way, it goes away to a certain extent as we get into colder weather. You know, gasoline, we think of it as elemental and we absolutely have an elemental response to it. Uh, but it's actually about eight or nine different components. One of those components uh, is butane, you know, like you get in a butane lighter or, you know, maybe a butane stove or something. It has very, very high octane and great characteristics for gasoline, but it raises uh, the vapor pressure and it makes for more evaporation in the summer. Uh, once we get to September 15th, and probably much earlier than that, actually, you can basically use those components and generate uh, more gasoline and uh, pump out more gasoline. I I've been doing this since 1980. You know, don't let my Doogie Hauser young looks or delicate features sort of mislead you. I've never seen a year like 2022. Absolutely insane. I'd have to go back to college when I was asked to siphon gasoline to find anything similar to it. You never get the taste out of your mouth, by the way. Um, but I think that probably part of Dean's message is beware this little interlude right now where prices are a bit more palatable for people. Uh, because part of it has to do with the releases from the Strategic Petroleum Reserve. We've seen all-time new highs for everything across the barrel diesel fuel, gasoline, jet fuel, uh, asphalt, you name it, all-time new highs because we did go to $120 or so for crude oil uh, in March. Prices have moved down to where they're sort of floating around $90 a barrel for crude. And largely the reason is probably that crude oil that was released from U.S. reserves helping to temper some of the enthusiasm in world markets. But you know, the day of, of calling is coming up in October when the sales are supposed to be suspended. And, you know, it was a gambit by the administration to put this oil on the market along with some other producers, but it was mostly a U.S. effort. And, you know, one wonders with a gambit whether they're playing chess or they're looking at NFL uh, mm -hmm. football plays, if, if it's going to work. And the jury is still out on that. So I, I would say that one of the problems we see, we, we do see that uh, this global refining shortage, uh, again, not caused by Barack Obama or Joe Biden, but just part of a shortage uh, based on the notion of a lot of refineries will not be able to comply uh, with uh, upcoming regulations and so forth. But a lot of the refineries were operating at close to 95% of cap capacity east of the Rockies. Tom, if I, could, if I could stop you just for a second. You were sure. saying that, uh, and just make sure I got this right, that it doesn't really, the Biden administration or the Obama administration doesn't really affect it. But then you say that one of the problems is whether or not these refineries or these operators can comply with the new regulations. Who, yeah, not, not, who is not, it that's doing these regulations? Because as best I can tell is that now, I know what our state regulations are, but a lot of this is federal policy that's passed down. That is the regulation. And it changes. Right. It's not brand new regulation. So what, what I would suggest is that it has to do with the whole decarbonization effort that goes on. And I would uh, I wouldn't condemn them, but I would criticize the Biden administration for having a dialogue with oil and gas companies that was more like Khrushchev in the White House in the 60s, where he said, we will bury you. You know, but it's may, become very it, punitive. The best I can tell, with with some of the timelines they've set up with the current, some of the acts from Congress and the penalties that are coming in now to uh, some of these companies uh, that we've never seen before, and that's to me that's policy. That is that is regulation, and those are dictated usually by you know different administrations. Uh, that was that just that confused me because we've seen 
you know, gas down below two dollars a gallon here. Uh, not in the. I, I understand, but it's absolutely disingenuous to blame President Biden for it, or to blame President Trump. I mean, one could say that President Trump was responsible because when OPEC was falling apart in April 2020 with negative crude numbers, he intervened to put together this OPEC plus cartel with Russia. So it's very, very injudicious to blame the presidency, whether it's this presidency or the three presidencies before them. And on the keystone, I have to tell you that, you know, it's a very effective messaging tool uh, in politics to say, you know, to have Joe Biden and I did that. He didn't. That's nonsense. And Keystone was not going to be operational until 2024 or 25. So I would suggest that when you start to intercede politics with the actual message of what's on the ground, you confuse people. And, you, you know, I'm going to finish with this because I think this is an important term. Uh, Everybody in 2022, from producers to refiners and to companies like Opus that publish a lot of information and data for them, we've profited from that. We actually have. The folks that haven't, and I think this is what we really need to address, are the marketers. You know, the marketers in Kentucky, I looked this morning, and the gross margin, which is very, very misleading. It's what it costs to bring fuel into the station and then, uh, you know, sell it on the street. The gross margin might be 30 cents or something like that. Not much different from what we've seen in the last few years. But as one of your panelists indicated, uh, credit card fees uh, swallow something like 10 or 15 cents of that. And, uh, you know, the last time we saw prices that high was in 2008, when the federal minimum wage law of 650 was largely in effect. Now you've got a lot of places where you got to pay 15 or $20 for these workers. So it's a basket of inflation. And the marketers have probably been the biggest losers, particularly the small marketers. You know, a big box store wants you to get uh, fuel up with gasoline there so they can sell that 50 gallon tub of mayonnaise and the diaper box or the shed that, that stores them. But the small marketers are really kind of victimized by this greening of America. So I'll summarize that and say, it's all about crude. I absolutely agree with Dr. Dean that diesel prices could go completely apocalyptic later this year. Uh, but I think that, uh, you know, this is the cost of being part of a world market. The United States is actually a privileged continent right now in that our natural gas prices are about one seventh or one eighth of what they are in Europe and our electricity costs are a lot lower. And that means that when you have to sell things at global prices on the refining side, right now the refinery profits are off the charts from where they were years ago, but it's not collusion. It's absolutely the market demonstrating that uh, there are more buyers than sellers. And what I'm worried about in, in you know, anticipating a question on this is that when we saw prices go to 120 for crude and to $5 for retail, uh, it wasn't just the fundamentals, although the fundamentals were very, very frightening. It was the investment and the speculation on Wall Street. At this moment, we're seeing the least speculation and investment in oil futures and gasoline futures that we've probably seen in two decades. What happens if they come back? I think that's a big consideration. And it's probably something the White House should be looking at. All right. Well, that is certainly a lot to unpack. And um, I, I apologize. We're starting to lose some of our members. And we still have a couple other guests. I want to give you the opportunity to speak if you do. Do I have any questions, Chairman Gooch? Do you have any comments or uh, anything you want to add? No, I mean, I think I'm, I'm very concerned. Um, you know, when we're talking about uh, the heavy crude, you know, when you're not making, making diesel fuel with it, uh, you know, it seems like, you know, you're, you have other things, uh, propane, uh, fuel oil, all those types of things that, yes, gasoline prices may be down a little bit, but, um, you know, natural gas and all of those types of things are way up. And I'm really concerned about people having the ability to pay their home heating bills uh, this uh uh, this winter, and I think I saw this morning where they were saying one in four Brits 
will not be able to pay their heating costs this you know this winter and uh, you know that's that sort of thing is coming this way particularly in my opinion I think we know uh, where the real problem is we know who the the, the real cost uh, who's responsible for this real cost and we don't have to uh, we don't have to name names in this committee it's it's obvious to, to, to everyone but um, you know it's because we have failed energy policies in this country so um, but I'm, I'm really concerned, you know, that we have a lot of folks out there that want to make us like Europe. And, uh, you know, we're, we're seeing that, uh, you know, all across Europe, people are not going to be able to pay their heating bills this, you know, this, this winter. Uh, I saw today where uh, India, for instance, was uh, saying that uh, at one point they were talking about uh, reducing coal-fired uh, generation by 25 gigawatts by between now and 2030. Now they're talking more like, uh, five gigawatts, so they are definitely not closing those uh, coal plants, uh, you know, and, and they're even saying now that there's no way they can be carbon neutral before something like 2070. And, uh, you know, we have a lot of other countries that I can tell you as people in, in England and France and Germany can't pay their utility bills, uh, there are going to be some major shifts in uh, the types of energy that they're using for electricity. And, uh, and heating their homes. It's, it's, it's just going to mandate that. And why this country uh, is willing to uh, say that, well, it's okay, we're going to, uh, you know, we're going to be carbon neutral when the rest of the world is not, um, it really just doesn't make sense. And uh, I think we have to stand up to that. We have to fight back to that. We have to show how idiotic uh, these policies are. So, Mr. Chairman, that's uh, my rant for today. All right, very good. And we're going to, I'm going to yield this time, uh, Scott, uh, Kisser, I, I'm going to kind of have you kind of wrap us up if you don't mind. And I think we do have just a few more questions, but we'll turn it over to you before we, I know members have other pressing issues to get to, and but I do want to make sure they get a chance to hear your comments. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, again, my name is Scott Kaiser, uh, Vice President of uh, Woodford Oil Company and Chairman of the Kentucky Petroleum Marketers Association. Uh, I'd like to just spend a moment to just give you perspective, um, you know, as a uh, fuel marketer in the Commonwealth. Um, I have some, some notes here that uh, I will try to condense here from um, the, the lengthier version because I know we're all pressed for time. So uh, I do want to mention something that we heard back in um, a June committee testimony uh, about the definition of the wholesale gasoline margin uh, that was somewhat misleading as it pertains to um, wholesale marketers. Uh, while the uh, Energy Information Administration considers our marketer members part of the wholesale piece of the gasoline supply chain, uh, as we saw earlier uh, in the other slides, uh, we make up only 8% of that wholesale margin. Um, the wholesale price is primarily driven by those ups and downs of the oil market. Uh, roughly 55% of it is uh, directly related to the global crude cost. Uh, the, as we saw, the other components are refining cost at 27%, uh, federal and state taxes at 10 and finally, um, the category that our members fall into, which is somewhat at the end of the, the entire supply chain uh, distribution and marketing at 8%. Um, and, and, you know, we... We learned earlier about the, uh, the crude oil prices can change up or down throughout each day, impacted by a host of, of, of factors that were discussed, including the geopolitics, the global market fundamentals, inventories, seasonality, supply chain disruptions that can happen, such as hurricanes. Um, some have slight impacts, while some have major impacts to our business and major impacts to energy pricing. Um, you know... As fuel marketers and retailers, our prices are determined by the fuel producers that make these products. And these prices are sent to us each evening based on the market dynamics and provided us to, the, to us via the web or through uh, email. And this published price is what Leah alluded to earlier, uh, effectively called you know, the rack price. And that's the price of the product I pay before any taxes that I, uh, for the product that I pick up at the terminals. Uh, these rack price adjustments can range from a few pennies on average uh, to as much as 15, 25 cents, or even as much as 35 cents as we saw this past spring um, during the onstart of the Russian-Ukraine war. 
and it's highly un- these these uh, prices are posted um, uh, throughout the day. Uh, some come in at six, some come in at noon. Very rarely do we get multiple price changes per day, but during um, uh, some periods of volatility, we will see multiple price changes a day, which affect our decisions of buying uh, and and determining what we've got in our current inventory and where we need to price at. Additionally, um, we the marketers uh, pay the motor fuels tax or the gas tax uh, on the price we pay on this fuel before it ever gets to the pump, where we may or may not recoup this cost when the product's sold to the end user. As Brian mentioned, or as uh, we mentioned earlier, uh, downstream marketers do not favor high fuel prices. As fuel prices rise, uh, margins get squeezed, volumes slow, and the cost of credit card swipe fees, which is a large portion of the retailer's cost of the product, as Leah mentioned earlier, increases exponentially. At this point, every fuel retailer, retailer must consider the cost of the next load that they're going to receive. Um, they got to consider things such as their credit line uh, and cash flow. Will those support what this increased product cost uh, is going to come in at? Uh, to avoid financial constraints on their own business, these retailers must adjust price in advance of these deliveries, especially during the volatile swings that we saw earlier this year. Uh, in short, we must cover our cost. Um, and that's the, the cost when the marketer buys the fuel, the cost when the retailer buys it, and how quickly the volume turns. It's all a matter of timing. It varies by location and then how quickly they can turn over their volume. Scott, can I ask you one quick question? Mm-hmm. Um, how many gas stations, because I, I know that that I've got little towns in my district, uh, like Vico, they, they don't have a gas station anymore. How many gas stations has Kentucky closed down, just say in the last decade, uh, because of regulation and other factors that, that affect them across the state? I mean, you've got to be dealing with probably the, the, the least amount. Mm-hmm. Now, you're seeing the, the big Buckies and the Flying Jays and stuff sort of come in, but they have to go where they have high volume. Mm-hmm. And so the little small mom and pops that have been around other rural areas have had to close their pumps and gas station and close out. And they may be maybe you know, a restaurant or something other now, but they're not a gas station anymore. Do you have any idea of how many mom and pops and small operators we've closed just in the last decade? Mr. Chairman, personally, I do not, but I'm going to defer your question to Brian um, as he may have some information on that. Sure. Um, I'm the executive director for the KPMA, and I can tell you in the last 10 years, I've, I've seen that adjustment in our numbers of what we talk about, how many fuel retailers that we represent here in the state. Um, today, that's around 2,300 stores, but I know not too long ago where it was 2,500 or more. Um, I can't tell you an exact number today, but in updates that we get uh, whether it be from national associations as they aggregate that information for states or just folks that we come in contact with, uh, it is very difficult for the small mom and pop retailer to stay in business. Uh, both uh, I had heard many, the numbers many almost pressures. half about that we've lost. Uh, we're almost about half of where we were uh, back around 1983. Uh, that's a lot of places that have closed down, a lot of small communities that they have to drive either to maybe a Walmart or a neighboring town. Or to, to be able to find uh, fuel or product or kerosene, even kerosene where we do light heat because these are usually the fuel stations mm-hmm. are where we are able to get the credits into rural impoverished areas for them to be able to get the, the, the kerosene and stuff to, to heat their homes on these credits. So it causes a tremendous undue burden uh, on some places uh, because of the overreach, because of the burden of the policies. Whatever anybody, whatever's wants to be said about that, I, I speak from experience. It, it closes these stores down, uh, and doing so, it pushes us into a smaller market, and all the dynamics of it are, are, are changing. And a lot of that is simply regulatory and policy that we're facing. Mm-hmm. Um, Mr. Chairman, now, and, and for the rest of the members of the committee, I'd, I'd like to just speak about um, the, competitive, the competitive nature of our industry. Um, overall, the retail fuel price at the pump, and, and I'm talking specifically at the pump that you go to to get your fuel needs, is the most transparent and competitive product offering in the United States. Uh, as demonstrated today, what most people do not realize and may not understand 
are the costs and factors of creating the product and getting it to us. Every gasoline consumer can see a fuel marketer's price sign from blocks away. They can check their mobile devices or they can just look at their social media news feed to find out where the best bargain is. These large price signs represent the value proposition we offer to our customers and these marketers work very hard to attract and keep these customers in daily. Um, as wholesale prices come down, fuel gets in the, in, in the ground and the current inventory is depleted and replaced, we do see prices come down. It's part of the free market system that has and always will correct on its own. And uh, with that, I'd like uh, to uh, turn the rest of our presentation over to my colleague, Leah, uh, who can give some perspective as an independent retailer. Uh, Leah, we've got about five minutes, but we're going to lose most of our people, so I'll let you go ahead and wrap it up if that's okay. Okay. Thank you. Th Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Thank you for the opportunity to speak today. Um, again, I'm Leah Taylor. I've been in this business for over 30 years, and I can tell you it's drastically different today than it was when I first started. I'm here to discuss some of the struggles that retailers uh, face in our day-to-day -day operations and how gasoline is priced. Retailers have little to no control over the factors that go into the cost of gasoline. It's not just the posted rack price that day that determines the cost. As discussed earlier, rack prices are highly volatile and they change on a daily basis. And as I mentioned earlier, the mitigating circumstances such as uh, world events and weather patterns, that can, that can change pricing in a day, sometimes twice a day, anywhere from 20 to 60 cents over a two, three day period. So it's extremely difficult to adjust the pump price as quickly as the rack price is changing. When gasoline costs increase, as Scott mentioned, our credit card fees go up. I, I went over with you an example of the $5 at $5. Those costs, it's very difficult for us to operate with such high credit card fees whenever we're only operating our business on pennies, pennies. So these are costs that our customers don't see, but they're absorbed by the retailer. Other fact factors we're unable to control include taxes on gasoline. Our customers don't see these charges as well because it's included in the price of gasoline. So when fuel taxes increase on a state or federal level, they have to be passed on to the customer, but for the most part, they are not aware that the taxes have increased and they just think that it's additional profit to us when it's not. Labor costs have affected our pricing extremely. Due to labor shortages and competition for employees, we have radically increased our labor costs. In addition to the wage increase, we've increased our overtime budget since we're working with fewer employees. My freight charges from common carriers, which is the cost to get the product from the terminal to my parking lot, has almost doubled due to inflation and their cost increasing as well. Mandates from the credit card industry and from government for new equipment to be uh, compliant with EMV standards have added to our costs. Equipment prices and maintenance on equipment have all increased dramatically. For example, when I started in this business, I could put in, I, I could put a, a station in just the, the components for a gasoline station, which is pumps, tanks, canopy, price sign, that type of thing, for $150,000. Now, today, depending on the number of pumps, it's anywhere from $600,000 to a million dollars. And that does not include the price of the land or the building that goes on that land. And that's before we ever sell one gallon of gasoline. So retailers get villainized in the public because of the perception that we are unfairly marking up the gas price for our own profit when we are not. I believe we are, as Scott talked about, I believe we are the only industry that is fully transparent at the pump to our customers and our competitors um, as to what we're charging for the product, which holds us all accountable and fair in our pricing. We're all looking for the same customer, the person with a vehicle that wants to fuel up. 
There are many stations to choose from in most towns in this state. And I can assure you that if, and, I'm sorry, there, there are many stations to choose from in most places in the state. And I can assure you that if we're not in line with what our competition is across the street or down the road, our parking lot's gonna be empty and their parking lot's gonna be full. And then they're not gonna be coming into my store to buy the merchandise that I have for sale inside. And then before long, I'll be quickly out of business. So we need to make enough profit to sustain our company and provide for our employees and their families. So as our costs rise, whether due to inflation, taxes, cost of goods, mortgages, infrastructure investments, we have to pass that along to our customers in order to cover those costs to provide competitive wages and benefits to our employees and be good community partners. It's a very delicate balance to be able to do that and still be competitive in the market. So I really appreciate <laughs> you all listening to us today. And Mr. Chairman, I'll just turn it back over to you if you have any questions for our group or if anybody wants to say anything else. Well, we, we appreciate you all coming. And it's been something that many of us uh, have, have heard about over the summer about the cost being so outrageous for families uh, that they just can't afford to, to be able to pay their bills and, and fill their tanks up. Uh, anytime we get that much uh, concern from our district, obviously we want to get to the bottom of it. So the purpose was to try to bring in as many people as we could, and, and unfortunately in a short period of time, which is not really fair to you all as presenters, but I wanted each of these members in here to know when somebody at home starts to ask you about this, that you have the best information that you can to share with them. And that's one of the great things about being on natural resources is you get to hear from the people that are out there in the middle of this. Uh, do we have questions I had? Uh, yes, please go ahead. Just a quick comment. I'd just like to say that I empathize with you, Leah, that I too was an independent operator. I bought an old Somerset gas station in Winchester many years ago. Oh and operated there and what we tried to do being surrounded with speedway and marathon was that we went to full service and you actually shoot yourself in the foot because you're going out and people aren't coming in your store so you try to look for creative ways to uh, get the gas out of the ground and we were very successful with that but the margin was so thin we didn't make any money inside the store so i can sit here and say that i see the very same challenges that you see Fortunately, I sold out and moved on, but it was a headache. It was a constant grind, and so I empathize with all these small-town operators across Kentucky. So thank you for your presentation. Thank you. Thank you, and then uh, Representative Bridges, quickly. Yes, I want to thank you for your testimony. In another lifetime, I did have several convenience stores and a truck stop, So, uh, and it's amazing that when – the prices are the highest is when you make the less amount of profit. And I understand that. And I just want to urge that knowledge to my colleagues because uh, uh, it's, it's not, you base your profit on pennies, not on percentages. It's just not feasible, you know, to do it any other way. And uh, when those costs go up, the charges you are paying are on percentages and you're still working with the pennies. So, uh, I just want to tell you I appreciate uh, the the battle you're facing and publicly state that, uh, you know, a lot of times you get a lot of false blame put on your shoulders, and uh, I appreciate what you do. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you, sir. Thank you. All right, for our committee members, we certainly appreciate you all. We, we don't want to lose our, our mom-and-pop gas stations. We don't want to make it more difficult for people at home. Thank you all for your valuable information. Obviously, there's a lot more. If any of our members want to speak to – to any of this group on your own, I'm sure they'll accommodate you and, and answer further questions. But with that said, do I have a motion to adjourn? Motion Friend. second. All those in favor, sign of aye. Can I, before we, oh, wait, wait, I'm wait. sorry. Uh, I, I'm talking, this regulation from Fish and Wildlife, I, I had just noticed something and I just wanted to bring it to your attention since it's on the agenda. The amendment. No. Well, uh, I don't know if I saw that. What did change? No, it's it's the section three is what I noticed. I'll just talk to the staff after the meeting. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. All right. With that, we stand adjourned. Thank you.